Well, hey there. Today we're going to be talking about chemical bonding. That's when two or more atoms join together to make a compound. Today's objective is that you'll be able to tell what type of bond is made between two different elements, and you'll be able to show how ionic bonding occurs. Well, one of the first questions we have is, why do elements bond anyways? Why don't they just stay by themselves? Well, the biggest reason is stability. They want to be stable. Generally, they follow something called the octet rule. That has to do with valence electrons. And so the rule is that eight valence electrons, I'm going to include that in here, valence electrons is great. If they get eight valence electrons, then generally they're going to be stable because they're going to be like the noble gas that's nearby them. And they bond in, the, in order to share or exchange electrons in order to have eight around them. So there are three types of bonds that we need to know about. The first one is called nonpolar covalent. And nonpolar covalent is also called covalent sometimes too. Just you can drop the nonpolar. But this is where the electrons are being shared equally and pretty much equal sharing. Sometimes not totally equally, but we're going to call it equal enough. And sometimes I'll just put NPC for nonpolar covalent. Polar covalent. The polar part of that means that they are being shared. The covalent means shared, but the polar means that they're not equally being shared. There's one element that is drawing the electron closer to itself, and that is a lot of times abbreviated as just PC, polar covalent. And then we have ionic bonds. This is pretty much where sharing doesn't even occur at all. It's where the electrons are transferred from one element to another. And that's just called I for ionic. So how do you tell the types of bond that you have in a compound? Well, that's found by the electronegativity difference. Electronegativity difference is abbreviated END, and that's what I will have it from now on. I'll just put END. You're going to want to write this little chart down in your notes so that you have it. If the END electronegativity difference is between 0 and 0 0.3, then we consider that a nonpolar covalent bond. If it's between point 3.1 and 1.7, that's a polar covalent. If it's between 1.71 and 3.3, that's an ionic. I know you don't know how to find these electronegativity differences yet. You will on the next screen that I show you. And these are just general terms. Sometimes when you get close to the edges at 0.3 and 0.31, it's tough to tell between nonpolar and polar if they're sharing equally or are they not sharing equally. But these are the general guidelines that you have to follow. In order to find that electronegativity difference, you have to use your periodic table. So I have a compound right here, KBr, and I want to know what kind of bonds happen between potassium and bromine. So if I look at my periodic table, and I zoom this up, then I can take a look at K and Br, and on the periodic table, you have little electronegativities down here in the bottom right-hand corner of each one of these. And so here's potassium right over here, and the electronegativity is 0.8. And then i got to find Br. Well, Br is right over here and Br's electronegativity is 2.8 so in order to find out what the electronegativity difference is I gotta subtract or find the difference between the two of them and so the difference I take the biggest one minus the smallest one and I get 2.8 minus 0 0.8 my electronegativity difference is 2.0 and I can see that that falls into the ionic this is an ionic bond that happens between those well, now I got something a little bit different here. I got CH4, which is methane. Now, the problem is this 4. What do we end up doing with this? Well, in order to tell the type of bond that happens, I just want to know between the two elements. It doesn't really matter to me. It matters, but as far as the bond type, it matters between C and each of these H's. So all I got to do, I don't do anything with that 4 at all. I just compare the electronegativities of C and H, and I find the difference between them. And so when I do that, I get this. Here's my carbon over here. It has an electronegativity of 2.5. And then my hydrogen is back over here, has an electronegativity of 2.1. So I had 2.5 and 2.1. When I do the electronegativity difference, I do the biggest minus the smallest, 2.5 minus the 2.1, and I get a 0 0.4 electronegativity difference, which is going to be a polar covalent bond between those two. Now I know I just got done saying that that little subscript doesn't really mean anything, but if you got something like this, N2, which is just an N bonded to an N, then what you have to do is you have to subtract those two difference, the, find the difference between those two N's. So when I take my periodic table again, and I look at the N's, and I find out that right here this is 3.0, really I have to do this. I have to say 3.0 
minus 3.0, which is going to be 0, 0.0, which is going to be a nonpolar covalent bond between that diatomic element. Another thing I want to show you is how ionic compounds are formed. Now generally, ionic compounds are going to be between a metal and a nonmetal. And so I've got a metal right here, aluminum, and a nonmetal, fluorine right here. And so what I'm going to do is do the Lewis dot structure for these elements first of all. Remember the Lewis dot structure is just the number of valence electrons, and so we can get that right from the periodic table. Aluminum has three valence electrons. That's what each one of those dots stand for. Fluorine has, is in group 17, has seven valence electrons, and we put two on each side. Now remember what has to happen here is the metals like to give away their electrons in order to go to the next energy level that's inside. Then they'll have eight valence electrons. And nonmetals like to gain valence electrons so that they can get eight. So I'm going to show you how this happens here. Aluminum will give one of its valence electrons over here to fluorine, which makes that fluorine stable now and happy. But aluminum's not happy because it still has two valence electrons, one and two, and it wants to get rid of them. So what it has to do is we have to have another fluorine that has seven valence electrons from the periodic table. And so this one of these other electrons goes over here to make this one stable now. Now it has eight. I like to cross these out too after they're gone so I know that they're gone. And now this aluminum still is not stable. It still has one valence electron. So you guessed it, we need another fluorine with its seven valence electrons. And now this one is going to come right over here and cross that out. Now everything is stable and here's what we end up with. The stable compound for between aluminum and fluorine is ALF3. You see that we got our three fluorines right here and our one aluminum and that's how ionic compounds form. Here's a couple more ionic compounds just for us to practice. Magnesium is the metal and so in this case we're going to have the um, oxygen has six valence electrons. It needs two more, so I'm going to take both of these over. I'm going to put two right there, cross these out, and now they're both stable. Mg has lost its valence electrons. Oxygen has gained, so it has eight. And so this is how you would write this stable compound, MgO. This one's a little bit different over here on the right-hand side. Don't let me trick you because I put the non-metal first and then the metal over here on this side. you got to know which one is which. But the metal is going to give away its electrons. And so what we have is these two will come over here, make that oxygen stable. But that aluminum is still not stable. We can't just pick up any other element we want to. we got to use another oxygen that has six valence electrons. Now this gets a little tricky because watch what happens. This one's going to come over here. But that makes that aluminum stable, but the oxygen is still not stable, so we need another aluminum. This could go on for a little while here. And so here we go. I'm going to take one of these from over here, make that oxygen stable, but now the aluminum's not stable. So we need another oxygen that has six valence electrons. I'm getting those valence electrons from the periodic table. Then I'm going to take both of these over and put them right here. Now everything's stable. We want to make sure we write the metal first every time. And that is going to be Al2. You see there are two aluminums up there. O3. That is the only way that aluminum and oxygen can make a stable compound with each other. Okay, so here's some practice problems for you to do. The first eight, I want you to tell me just the type of bond that would occur between those atoms. Is it going to be nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic? I would like you to show your numbers like I did on the other problems so that I can see what you're subtracting. In numbers 9 and 10, I give you two elements in each of those, a metal and a nonmetal, maybe not necessarily in that order, but I'd like you to show the ionic compound that would form just like I did with the arrows. Do the Lewis dot structure, show the arrows, and then write the formula for each one of them. Not too tough. You can do this. Have a great day. Bye-bye.